But as I was saying, we come to 1 Samuel chapter 31, which is, of course, the last chapter in what we have as 1 Samuel. And I told you before that in the original Jewish text, it's just Samuel. Uh, but I can't think of a better place to end what we know as 1 Samuel here uh, with what we have in the 31st chapter as the death of King Saul. And what I think we see here is some pretty stern warnings. God is not explicitly mentioned in this chapter, but I still think there are some lessons to be had about Him and more particularly about sin in this chapter. And we don't seem to be a people who really enjoy a good ending. Um, we don't like the ending of a vacation, the ending of the weekend. Never a good, never a good thought in my mind. Um, the bottom of the tub of ice cream. We don't necessarily like endings. I'm watching my three-year-old grow up and it's... Oh, it's painful to see her grow so fast in more ways than one. But I will tell you, this evening we affirm a very simple fact. The God of the Bible is the God of every ending. There's not an ending that God did not foresee, decree, or be very well aware of, or even if not a part of. The Bible actually says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, the things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. There's no ending which God is not over, at least in the, the grand scheme of things. There's no ending outside of God's sovereign purposes, and there are vital lessons to be learned from them. And in these closing chapters, we've been tracing the, the rise of David and the decline of Saul in the way of the Israelite kingship. Saul disobeyed God, and for that, God removed the, the kingdom from him and gave it to David. And even though God is not mentioned in this chapter again, I think we can learn a, a lot about him. Now, obviously, this is not the end of the story. It's the end of Saul. There's much left of the story to be told, and that's why, that's why there's a second Samuel. But I do like the words of Winston Churchill, the great prime minister of England during World War II. Uh, not long after the Allies had achieved some success in the North African campa uh, campaign, long before the war was over, Churchill actually told the English people, this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But perhaps... It's the end of the beginning. And I think you might say the same about David's reign as king. It's nowhere near reached its climax or conclusion. But if you found 1 Samuel 31, let me remind you that this is the same battle that was set up in 1 Samuel 28. When Saul was seeing the Philistines gathering for an attack against him, and we saw in 1 Samuel 29 and 30, David living in the land of the Philistines and they gathering for battle, this is that same battle. And while David is dismissed from the ranks of the Philistines, as we saw last time, we see Saul come to his final conclusion right here. If you notice in verse 1, it says, The Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. In verse 3, he's mortally wounded. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day together. Saul, the first king of Israel, was dead. Jonathan, the great friend of David, was dead. David's going to lament for both of them at the beginning of 1 Samuel. He actually writes a bit of a, a, a poem for them, kind of a psalm of sadness. Uh, but nevertheless, here in the end, the death and end of Saul's life, we see the, the absolute fulfillment of Jesus' words many years later, the absolute epitome of what Jesus told Peter. If you remember the night Jesus was arrested... Peter took off a sword and he hacked off the ear of the high priest's servant. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, put your sword back in its place for those that live by the sword will die by the sword. It's exactly what happened to King Saul in more ways than one. He sought to kill David and disobey God. Saul then dies by his own sword. Also notice that in this bitter end, Saul still refuses to cry out to God. Even in his dying moments, it doesn't occur to him. And we might talk about that, talk about why that is later. But I'd ask you, who would write your obituary when you die? Have you ever thought about that? It's kind of morbid. But it is not a conversation or a thought to be had only by hospice patients and senior saints. 
I wasn't going to say old people, but George, George Carlin said that we, used, we as Americans don't say we're getting old. We, we like to kid ourselves and say, I'm getting older. Yeah, you go. We're getting old. Stop lying. Ninety-two years, yeah. But that's not the, the but but the idea of an obituary, uh, uh, epitaph, is not something that should only be considered by people who are advanced in years. It's something worth thinking about, even if you're as young as some of us are in the room this evening, because in a sense you're writing your own obituary every day. I mean, what are people going to say when you're gone? Are they going to see anything more of what you've done? Now, I think we've all probably, if not most of us, have probably been to funerals where the preacher says a whole lot more good about the deceased than we might remember. Um, yeah. I want to know if it's the same. Am I at the right funeral? Uh, yeah. It's, it's a dark idea. But really, really, you're, you're kind of writing your own obituary every day. And it, it seems to sum up with this one serious truth. You live well, you die well. And if you um, live poorly... You die poorly, and I think that's true with Saul. Uh, when God appointed Saul as king, God gave Saul everything he needed to succeed. But Saul consistently did things his way instead of God's way. He bypassed God's will in his life, and he reaped the consequences of his own decisions. If you remember, he was called to defeat the Philistines, to do away with them. And here it is, the Philistines that ultimately bring about his death. Now, as I said a moment ago, God is not explicitly referenced here, but there's a serious lesson to be had within it. God is true to His Word. His judgment of sin is sovereign and just. And those who refuse and, re refuse and reject God's will, like Saul, will die by their own hands. We like to say that God sends no one to hell. People seemingly send themselves there by choosing, if we all agree in our ability to choose, to reject God. I'm not the greatest fan of FDR. In fact, I had kind of an uh, interesting conversation with my supervisor today who's a huge fan of Franklin Roosevelt. Not as much. But his wife, Eleanor, said something that really summarizes what I would say about this. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, One's philosophy is not best expressed in words. It, isn't, it is expressed in the choices one makes. In the long run, we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. The process never ends until we die. And the choices we make are ultimately our responsibility. And within the self-inflicted judgment and death of Saul, we find a warning about the self-inflicted sin of the world and God's judgment about it. What we're going to do tonight, I think, is, is sort of like what you see every single TV show do. At some point, if a TV show runs long enough, they will do something that kind of gets on my nerves, to be honest, because it's kind of a cheating cop-out of an episode. You'll know what I'm talking about. You watch enough TV shows. MASH did it. Seinfeld did it. Drake and Josh did it. I want to say even I Love Lucy did it. But what they do later in the show's run, they have an episode of nothing but flashbacks. You know what I'm talking about? The Golden Girls did it. They, they all do it. At some point, it's, it's an episode. You think it's going to be another good plot, another funny episode or something. And they're going to sit around at the coffee table or at the, the coffee shop or whatever. And they're just going to reminisce. And every 20 seconds, it's going to flash back to another episode that you've already seen. And you say, ah, I remember that. That's funny. That's the whole episode. Within this, I think it would be wise to kind of do that with the life of King Saul. If you flash back and think about all the things we've talked about. We've been studying 1 Samuel for a number of months now. And so in a similar sense, flashing back, looking at the life of Saul, I want to share with you three warnings of sin that we get out of this text. Three warnings that really convey the seriousness of what it means to be in rebellion against God and what will happen to those who are. Whether we need to know that for ourselves or the people around us, I want you to see firstly Saul's separation. Sin will separate you from God. Saul had been cut off from God. Like uh, a man who's given two weeks of employment left before his boss ultimately gives him the can, Saul was living on borrowed time already. He was separated from God and God's grace. Go back a couple of, well, a few chapters to 1 Samuel 28. And let me point out again, Saul makes no real effort to cry out to God when he dies. But even earlier, you might protest that because of what we previously read, though. I think you'll see that he didn't really have any serious love for God. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. In 1 Samuel 28, 
uh, it says that Samuel died in verse 3. All Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land, which is probably there to tell you how wicked it was that he went and consulted a witch in the middle of that chapter. Um, oh, I forgot I had that quote on the screen. See, that's Eleanor Roosevelt, in case you forgot. That's her. Anyway, so 1 Samuel 28, Samuel dies. We get the recollection of Samuel's burial and all that kind of thing. Talks about Saul's original intent to get rid of the necromancers and sorcerers and stuff. But in 1 Samuel 28, it says, The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel. They encamped at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid. His heart trembled greatly. And when he inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. The Urim and the Thunim, that was the way they would figure out God's will by lots in the Old Testament. God wasn't answering him. God left the phone off the hook, which is a horrifying thought in my mind. To pray and God doesn't listen? That might just be the clearest example in the life of Saul, perhaps all the, the stories of the Bible, of how sin will cut you off and separate you from God. Not an isolated idea either. That's all up and down the Bible. For example... In Psalm chapter 66, the Bible says, If I cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Proverbs 28, If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. In Proverbs 15, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. And Brilliant. Great minds think alike, Uncle Dillard. Your sins have made a separation between your iniquities, excuse me, have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And even the New Testament says the same thing. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, Peter says. His ears are open to their prayer, but, to the, face, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You get it. Sin cuts you off from God. It places a giant pair of proverbial earmuffs over the ears of God so that he doesn't hear what kind of prayer you would seek to offer him. He doesn't listen. And why should he? If you're going to so obstinately run away from him and run straight towards sin, what makes you think he would incline his ear to you? It's a sad thing. And I know churches across the land these days are absolutely populated and inhabited by people who are so infested and infatuated with sin, it's a wonder they dare call themselves Christian at all. But they are those people that would still call out to God and wonder why their prayers aren't being answered. It's because sin separates you from God. You look at Saul. Let's flash back. I say he selfishly disobeyed God. If you go back to 1 Samuel 13, you remember God appointed Saul to be king and rescue Israel from the Philistines. And for a while he did that. He was a great king, was being a key word there. But if you look at chapter 13, Saul did Samuel's job. He offered an unlawful sacrifice. If you remember, he was waiting on Samuel to come and offer sacrifice. Samuel didn't show up fast enough. And then Saul takes it upon himself to offer sacrifice. And even in the minute, Samuel shows up. In verse 11 of 1 Samuel 13, it says, Samuel says, what have you done? And Saul says, when I saw the people doing all these kinds of things, I said, the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. And so I've not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself, I forced myself, he says, and offered a burnt offering. I did your job. I had to force myself to do it, Samuel. Right. And Samuel wisely said, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God. Nobody told you to do that. Nobody told you to offer sacrifice. That's my job. You're king. I'm priest. Got it? Or prophet, rather. And it was in that instance, by the way, uh, God tells Saul through Samuel, notice in verse 14, your kingdom shall not continue. There's strike one. A couple of chapters later, we see that Uh, Actually, in 1 Samuel 14, if you remember, Saul has that rash vow, almost causes his own son to die. But in 1 Samuel 15, now we see that in the previous chapter, Saul did what he wasn't told to do. And if you remember, in chapter 15, he didn't do what he was told to do. He did both. Sin of omission and commission is the King Saul. In 1 Samuel 15 too, God tells him, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel and opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go, strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. That's a hard verse for a lot of people to understand. That's another sermon. But if you remember what happened, the Bible says that he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people at the edge of the sword, but... They spared the king, Agag, and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatted calves and lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. 
literally did not do what he was told to do. And then God says about Saul to Samuel, I regret that I've made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. So this is why I say that Saul had selfishly disobeyed God. Clearly disobeys God. He began to think he knew better. Oh, yeah. And as we saw a couple of weeks ago, Samuel, when he appears back from the grave, he says the same thing. Remember when he sees Samuel at the wish of Endor, does King Saul? Samuel tells him, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against, fierce wrath against Amalek, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Selfishly disobeyed God, like he knows what's best. Thus you can see Saul's separation comes from selfish disobedience. Further, I would say he also shallowly desired God. Not serious desire in Saul's heart was there for God. In that same story... Yeah, right. But we want to say it was the power of God. We, we talked about that. No, I don't suppose. But in that same chapter where Saul will do that beforehand, before he goes to the witch, he prays, God doesn't answer. That's 1 Samuel 28, uh, 5 and 6. But in verse 7, literally the next verse, Saul says, Find for me a woman, seek out a woman who's a medium, and I may go inquire of her. Do you think he was really inquiring of God? No. No. No, no. You see, the thoughtful thing would be to do, ask myself why God is not listening to me, repent, reevaluate, take stock of the situation, and it's remarkable how many people can't do that. I've seen people, even in recent months, people caught in an egregious error, doing something objectively wrong, wondering why they're facing the consequences they are, and yet completely incapable of looking in the mirror and asking, okay, how did I get here and what did I do? Because a lot of times our problems are not necessarily exterior or external so much as they are self-inflicted. At least that's been my experience. And I say he shallowly desired God because he wasn't seriously praying. And again, I'm going to read that verse from 1 Peter 3. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayer. If Saul really had a heart for God, God would have listened. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. He selfishly disobeyed God. He shallowly desired God, and he sinfully denounced God. Saul knew going to a witch was an abomination. God said through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or a one who inquires of the dead. Because if they are real, they're doing it by the spirit of faith. Plus, not only does that in the law, Saul spent the early parts of his reign getting rid of witches and necromancers and the, the like. So, why am I telling you this? We're talking about how sin separates. I tell you because sin has the same effect on us today. Your sin will have the same effect. When we willfully disobey God, we are nullifying and torpedoing our own prayers, cutting ourselves off from grace. Again, to read that verse from Proverbs 15, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. When you shallowly desire God, you won't get far. And that's why he said through the prophet Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Not with half your heart, like John Mayer sings. All your heart. When you denounce God, he denounces you. When you disown God, he's forced to disown you. How can we not make that conclusion here? Both in studying the stories of Saul and the words of Christ. When Jesus said, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. The first warning we have here is that sin will separate you from God. Saul's separation. You might also look at Saul's deterioration. Remember, the lesson we find in the life and untimely death of Saul is what sin will do to us. We see that it separates you from God, but it also deteriorates you further away from God in a sense of the snowball effect of sin, that you will progressively worsen. It's like an infectious wound that is just gangrenous and gets worse over time. I will tell you that when Saul was named king, it was a great day. 1 Samuel chapter 10, it says, Samuel said to all the people when he crowned Saul king, when he anointed Saul king, do you see him who the Lord has chosen? There's none like him among all the people. And the people shouted, long live the king. He was a great guy early on. He was a good king until sin got a hold of his heart. 
And that's what sin will do to you. It will separate you from God, yes, but it will deteriorate you even further. I'm a sucker for stories about Titanic. I love reading about Titanic. Uh, and not just because of the movie. You need to go see the museum in Branson if you've not seen it. It's incredible. But did you know the Titanic, of course, sits at the bottom of the Atlantic today, where it's been for the last 100 plus years. But did you know that within a certain number of years, there's not going to be any more Titanic? You know that. The ocean is slowly but surely eroding and eating what's left of Titanic through rust and decay and ruin. And I like to think of that in a way of thinking of sin, because here we have the greatest ship the world had ever seen at the time, by the way, foolishly was said of the ship, not even God himself could sink this ship. <laughs> Smooth. Didn't make it across the Atlantic on her first trip. But now she sits at the bottom of the ocean, and one day there's not going to be anything left of her at all. And I think the same can be said of the sinful soul who is lost without God. It's only going to get worse. You're not going to drift toward God. You ever notice that? You're going along in the daily ho-hum of everyday living. It's not as if when you're not paying attention to thing, things, you get closer to God. You drift away from God. We need to pay much closer attention to what we've heard lest we Amen. drift away from it. I'm not much on Star Wars anymore. Disney's ruined Star Wars. I've completely lost interest in Star Wars. But back when I was still watching Star Wars, Jedi Master Yoda once said, Fear, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering, and sin is just that way. Those who practice Saul's actions will receive the same result. They too will deteriorate and ruin themselves the same way he did. It's the second warning of sin we see in Israel's first king. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you how sin leads to decay. Look at every alcoholic, every drug addict, every porn addict, every gluttonous and slothful person knows that vices and evils seem to snowball. So you see that sin will separate you. Sin will deteriorate you. And notice thirdly and lastly, not only his separation and deterioration, see thirdly, Saul's annihilation. Returning to our main text in 1 Samuel 31. Let me read it again. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. Jonathan, who was in my mind a righteous guy, dies alongside his dad. And in verse 4, Saul tells his underling here, kill me. He's not going to kill his own king. So Saul kills himself, which is an interesting thought. If you go home and read 2 Samuel 1, when there's a young Amalekite comes along and claims to have done it, I'm inclined to believe Saul did it because of what this says. Saul fell on his sword and died. That being said, sin has the assured annihilation of man since we were exiled out of the Garden of Eden. Sin will destroy self. Saul died here, not just by the hand of the Philistines, not by the hand of his enemies, not even necessarily by the just judgment of God, so much as it was his own choice. I think it was part of God's decree, God's judgment, but he killed himself. Makes me think of a conversation I and every teacher will ever have till the end of time at the end of every semester. You know what happens at the end of every semester of my life? I'm going to have a handful of knuckleheads, sometimes just one, one or two, but a small group. They're going to come to me and they're going to say, with a failing grade, what can I do to pass? How can I pick up my grade? And every fiber and atom in my being wants to scream, nothing, too late. Sorry. Now, granted, in our world today, what am I told? You have to remediate. You have to help them pick up their grade. But in reality, the reason that child is failing U.S. or world history is not because of me. It ain't because of their mommy or their daddy. It's not because of the principal. It's not because of Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It's because of them. It's a self-inflicted thing. Sin will destroy self just as much as we can kind of tank our own grades in school. It will destroy you. You got no one to blame but yourself. I heard the story. I don't know if this is true. I tried to fact check it. I had a hard time trace, chasing it down. It may be an apocryphal story, but an interesting story nonetheless. Supposedly in the early 1980s, and if y'all saw this on TV, please do tell. It would kind of confirm whether or not it actually happened. But in the early 1980s, supposedly ABC News ran a story about this modern art piece where it was a chair with a loaded shotgun pointed at the chair. And it was an exhibit that people would stay in line for, sign waivers to see, pay money to sit in, and they would sit in this chair for a minute. What I let, forgot to tell you is that the chair was, that the shotgun was loaded and it was set to go off at some point in the next few years. Don't know when. And so people would pay money, sit in this chair for a minute, and then they can say they cheated death. I, again, I'm not sure if that actually happened, 
But I will say this, as foolhardy as that is, it seems to illustrate exactly what sin will do. You're gambling with your soul every day you're running away from God, foolishly ignoring the risk until the inevitable destruction comes about. It will destroy yourself. It will destroy your surroundings. Notice in verse 5, when Saul's armor bearer saw that he was dead, he fell upon his sword and died too. Thus Saul died, and his three sons also. His armor bearer, all his men, they all died, arguably because of the sin of Saul. Saul will not only destroy yourself, it will destroy those around you. It'll destroy your surroundings. It'll destroy a society. You want to know why our society's in the toilet? I'll tell you, it's because of sin. Amen. Later on in this chapter, it says, When the men of Israel, in verse 7, who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan, saw the men of Israel had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. And we don't have time to read the rest of it. But that part of Israel's territory was ceded to the Philistines for a while because of sin. You want to know why we have the problems we do? It's sin. Because ultimately, it's not that it just destroys yourself, your surroundings, your society. Sin destroys souls. Those that are made in the image of God. It is very, very clear from the teaching of Scripture. James, the brother of Jesus, says, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Sin will destroy your soul. In addition to a whole bunch of other stuff, there it is. Um, I was reading about another preacher whose uh, eldership didn't like the way he was preaching. No, it's, this isn't anybody you know. This is a guy in another country, actually. And he was preaching a lot on sin, and he was talking about how debilitating and deadly it was. And some of the churchmen came to him one evening, and they said, you know, we really don't like you talking about that kind of stuff. We don't want you to talk as openly uh, as you do about man's guilt and corruption, because if our kids hear about that, they might more easily become so much more sinful. Call it a mistake, if you will. Call it missing the mark. But do not speak so plainly about sin. And I don't understand how in the anecdote this minister happened to have this on his desk. But as the story goes, uh, he took down a small bottle and showed it to his visitors and said, You see this label? It says, Strixinin. And underneath in big, bold red letters, it says, Poison. He says, What you're asking me to do is change the label. Suppose I do, and paste over it with the words, essence of peppermint. Don't you see what might happen? Someone would use it not knowing the danger involved and would certainly die. So it is too with the matter of sin. I love this. The milder you make the label, the more dangerous you make the poison. That is true. So here we close 1 Samuel, and you know, we'll see what we have in store next. But as terrible as sin is, and how it would separate you, and deteriorate you and annihilate you. The Bible does say if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is the blessing we have in Christ. And it's one that I think should give you a lot of comfort. When you look at the horrors of sin and realize what Jesus saved you from, it's not necessarily just a meandering, meaningless existence without Christ that you're spared from. It's all of this and more that you are spared from because of the grace of Christ. And that's not something I suppose any one of you didn't know. But I would guarantee you, a lot of the people around you don't know that. And, you, and even more, tell those other people about it. Yeah. You get numb to it. Um, and we're, we're going to sing one more time. That's usually our custom. But if, if it's all right with you all, I would like to conclude, because we just finished a book, I'd like to pray. If, if that would be all right with you. Father God, thank you so much for having inspired the scriptures for us to study for all time. Lord, it is a testament to your will for us that we would know who you are and know how you would have us to live by the fact that you have provided, preserved, and given us your word. And I pray that through this study we have learned what it would mean to be faithful, as, as King David will be at times, as, as though he does fall at times, we know that he is a man after your own heart. Father, I pray we can see the negative example of Saul and learn not to follow in his footsteps. I pray we can look at the faithfulness and the, the sheer spiritual dexterity of the prophet Samuel, the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, and learn what it means to be a faithful servant of yours. But above all these things, Father, I pray that you would bless those for having been here tonight, for dedicating some time of their week to worship and to be together and to study your word. I thank you for the chance we've had over the last few months to study this text. And for indeed, however many more you'll give us until you return for, the, for your church. And it's in the Lord's name we pray. Amen.